Welcome to the Resume Storyteller, bringing you interviews with industry experts, regular folks who tested the job search waters and succeeded, and strategies to tell your story and land you job interviews. Here's your host, Virginia Franco. Hey guys, we have with me recruiter and talent acquisition leader, Tabitha Cavanaugh, aka Tab the Recruiter. She is first and foremost a human that cares about human, other humans. Uh, she's a cancer survivor, turned recruiter, turned talent strategist, and she just cares deeply about building meaningful connections that last. After getting laid off when she was six months pregnant and earning her last four positions without applying, she wants to make sure that every job seeker can land a fulfilling role and do it so the right way. Um, from healthcare to tech, she works to help teams to recruit better while putting a strong emphasis on the candidate experience. And today she wears many, many hats. She is a senior corporate recruiter, recruiter for Syndigo, founding member of Talent Champions, and the Never Too Young Advisory Co-Chair for the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Um, Tabitha, did I get all those all of those hats right? And thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you. I am so excited to be here. And yes, you absolutely nailed it. I was just thinking, wow, great intro. Thanks, Virginia. <laughs> thank you. Well, I've followed you for a long time. So I know I feel like I know a lot. Of, I can write your bio. Um, <laughs> so for the listeners, you heard the brief bio, but I would love for you to give just a quick overview of you know what it is you do and how you came to be a recruiter. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, now I'm a senior recruiter with Syndigo. I absolutely love my job. I I say I have the best job on the planet and I really feel like I do. At least for me, it's just the alignment is fantastic. So like most recruiters, uh, like a lot of people will say, they accidentally fell into recruiting. And that is kind of what happened to me. It was a little bit intentional, a little bit not. You know, we don't go to college to be recruiters. That's just not a thing, I think absolutely something that we need to change. Um, but that's probably for another conversation. So, <laughs> you know, I, um, I had cancer and after that battle, I was just like, you know what, what am I doing with my life? What do I want to be when I grow up? Right. And I, I just thought my sales and marketing and my relationship building, what could I use that for? And I remembered a conversation I had with a recruiter and I just thought, Oh, you know, maybe I can do that. And so I put my, so I literally put one foot out. I like started to step out into exploring that and ended up finding my first opportunity to join a really a great boutique agency out of Nashville. Um, I'll plug them thinking ahead, executive search. They were phenomenal mm -hmm. to start my career with. And the leader that I started there with, I'm actually back with now, which is something that it really oh is just come full circle. I know the relationship it's a really building, cool right? Story. Yep, exactly. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm recruiting kind of all across the board for a SaaS company. And um, I, I recruit a lot of different positions, but it's it's why I wait. One of the reasons I wake up every day, um, you know, outside of my family and, and all of that. So it's a great, a really great career path. Oh, I love that. Um, so would you mind explaining to me and to other people like we're in kindergarten, what are the, I know that there's different kind of recruiters internal contract, all of that, would, can you break it down in terms of the different types that there are, you know, for those of us who are, might be in the dark? For sure. Absolutely. And this is a question that I find a lot of people want to know, but for some reason don't really ask. And so there's a lot of confusion around it. But when I started, I started an agency and basically what that means is we're a third party. We would connect with, let's say, your corporate organization, and we would be essentially an extension of your current effort. When maybe you have a talent acquisition team, maybe you don't. Um, but we are we come in, um, and there's a couple different ways of external recruiting. Um, there's contingent, you know, there's fee for service, and essentially what that means is sometimes I could be hired to come work on a project, um, a new search, and maybe they pay us up front. Um, and that is typically fee for service. And then sometimes contingent is another option that people go with. And that is basically, um, it's a performance driven. So if I fill your position, um, then you pay me, but if I don't fill it, then you have not paid me anything. And so that's one of the other ways to look at external recruitment, which are typically those recruiters that work for an outside agency. What I do now is a corporate recruiter or 
quote unquote inside recruiter. There's kind of a lot of ways people like to refer to us. Um, but basically that means I work for one company, whereas in the agency world, I'm representing a multitude of clients. So it just depends on how many at any given time. But on the corporate side now, I'm representing one company, Syndigo. And it's really exciting. The reason I personally love working corporate more is because I feel more aligned with the organization, the mission, you know, the people I'm hiring, they're my colleagues. And and I find that very invigorating to be able to know that I'm hiring people that are just going to continue to propel and up-level the success that we're already having. So hopefully that gave a little bit more insight into some of the different kinds of recruiters out there. But I'll wrap it up by saying, you know, job seekers typically can't, you don't like hire a recruiter to help you find a job per se. So that's kind of a backwards way of doing it. And I don't really know people out there that are... I guess that'd be more like a career coach. So if they're going to hire a coach to help them navigate the career journey, a recruiter is likely only going to help you navigate the journey that you're in at any given moment with any given client that they have. And they're typically super focused on a position for you. And if they don't have a fit for you, then they're likely not going to invest as much time. Now, there are absolute exceptions to that. Um, I definitely take a little bit of a different approach, but I would say in terms of understanding the world of recruitment and what it looks like as a whole, that's probably the best way to, to, to think about things. That is excellent. So let me just recap. So external agency recruitment is third party, and that can either be fee for service where you they pay up front or uh, contingent where it's based on the outcomes. Um, inside corporate recruiting, the company has an internal staff dedicated to hiring people and the recruiters ultimately will be your colleagues. Um, and recruiters do not generally work to find their, their, you are not their clients. Their clients are the companies that they are searching, searching to find Correct. a fit for. And that that's their focus. Is that right? Right. Okay. Yes. I think that's a great recap for me. I'm okay. essentially balancing the needs of the business with the needs of the care of the candidates that are coming through our process. So it's really facilitating all of that. You think of us as sales, marketing, project management, you know, we're kind of a mishmash of all of these different transferable skills, which is why I tell people if they're thinking about getting into recruitment, if you love people, in my opinion, that is the heart of what we do. Right. I know. I, and I yeah. have seen that from you and, and a handful. <laughs> awesome. So in terms of, the contingent um, people who, who pay, work on a contingent basis, is it also the case where a company might say, here's the posting and have four or five different agencies be simultaneously looking to fill it? Yes, that okay. absolutely happens. And that is more so in the contingent world, right? Because they're not investing money. It's like anything else. It's like, I mean, if you want to lose weight, and you and you know you invest five dollars a month in something. It's much easier for you to just kind of forget about it, ignore it. Right. Um, you haven't really invested anything. But when you're more invested, you're going to be more of a partner. You're going to be more of a consultant. You know, you're you're going to want to put more into something because you have stake in the game. And so that I think is the best way to explain contingent recruiting is that organizations don't really have stake in the game. And especially when they're hire when they're, you know, hiring all these different agencies to work with them, it just, there's chaos, it's confusion. You've got people stepping over other people. I mean, you've got to think yeah. about your brand, your employer brand. And in my opinion, you're absolutely, you know, kind of chipping away at that and diminishing that when you have all of these different, when you're spread so thin across all these different resources, not to mention contingent recruiters. And again, I'm generalizing. But contingent recruiters are typically very motivated by commission. Um, right. And so, so it's, yeah, it's a different mm-hmm. it's a different mindset. And I think what you said about the chaos probably also is a, maybe a big part of the reason why you hear so much about people being ghosted. Um, because when there's chaos, things get lost in the shuffle, and people that are you know motivated by commission sometimes are on to the next thing as quickly Absolutely. as possible if there's not a good fit, right? 
Exactly. You're not it, like they, they see, again, I'm generalizing, but essentially sure. as a contingent recruiter, you're seeing dollar signs because you're like, okay, this person, if they're not a good fit for my role, then yeah, on to the next. And sometimes people let those fall by the wayside or, or you're yeah. stepping on toes. I mean, imagine what if I'm coming, what if I'm coming after you, but you've already been, uh, you know, reached out to by the other four recruiters working on the same search. I mean, that's not a good experience for you. It's especially if one of them already decided you weren't going to move forward. And then one decided you were, and it just, it's, it's chaos. And I think that's, <laughs> that's the best word for it. Um, thank you. That really helps a lot. Um, as I do, I, I know a lot of people are confused by all of that. Um, and yeah, the purpose of this podcast for anyone listening is to uh, break down recruiting, you know, fundamentals um, for lay people. Um, all right. So next question I wanted to ask you, Tapitha, is could you walk us through the, you know, behind the scenes, behind the curtains process that goes on but during the, between the time when, you know, a need gets identified to when a posting, a job posting comes out. What does that look like? And what's the time? Frame? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I would say it's a loaded question with probably a okay. lot of different answers based on process within each organization. But generally, you know, you've got the business that identifies a need, whether it's because someone left um, through some type of attrition or, you know, there's a growth opportunity for the team and they're just looking to add. So essentially they identify that this opening, you know, needs to be filled. Um, mm -hmm. So from there, at some point along the way, again, depending on the process and without getting too granular, you know, I am selected, let's say, as the lead recruiter for the search. From there, I'm doing a few different things. And, and something that I think is really important that sometimes is missed and goes by the wayside is the qualifying call that I would have with a hiring manager. So I'm not just taking a job description at face value because job descriptions are filled with jargon and they don't necessarily always represent the voice of the company yeah. or the, the culture of a specific team within the company. And so in getting to know more about the manager and their team and what does their week look like? How do they support their team members? Do they do happy hours? Like I'm trying to dig in and find out all this information. So when I have a conversation with the end user, which is the candidate, the job seeker in this, in this point, then I'm able to paint this really great full picture about not only our company, because of course our company is an important piece of it, but I also like to break it down into the role specifically as well, because within our larger organization, of course, each team has their own little mini, you know, micro culture. So okay. basically from there, I'm having this qualifying call. Ultimately, you know, I'm drafting a job description that will be seen by the public. And then from there, so essentially, no, oh, go ahead. So you're brought in ideally right at that in stage one to partner with the hiring manager to finesse and craft the posting. Exactly. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So, and not all recruiters are brought in like that. Not every organization has a process like this. And if you're an outside recruiter, it could be a lot more difficult to get mm -hmm. something like a qualifying call going, but generally that's it. But what I, what I need that people to understand is that, you know, there are a million things that happen in this, in this time frame. And as a job seeker, your best opportunity for landing a job is just by relationship building and by knowing people that know about these jobs. Because I can't tell you, you know, I have so many examples of times where people invested time with me. And as soon as a job popped up, before I had the chance to do the qualifying call, before I had the chance to post it online, I'm already thinking of people that could be a potentially great fit for the role. Um, and that happens because they took the time to build relationships and to stay in touch and to, you know, do other things that add value, maybe by adding uh, or, or sending over a referral to me for another position. So there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes for sure in between when we identify that we have a need and that person, you know, their butt is in the seat. Um, you know, there's about a million right. things that happen. Along right. the way. I mean, you're building that pipeline out while this is all, while steps two and three are all going on then. Exactly. And what I hear a lot from Canada or from, well, I guess I'll say job seekers, if they're not in the process yet is, yeah, you know, like, thanks, but I'm happy where I am. And while that's all good, and I'm, I'm the first person to say, that's great. I love alignment. And so if you're happy where you are, that makes me truly happy. But let me ask you, what happens when 
tomorrow, something unexpected happens. Maybe you're laid off, your company, something happens with your company, something happens in your personal life and you need to leave your job. I mean, you need these certain things to be in place. You need an updated resume, something that you're really always tweaking and always thinking about, um, you know, and a relationship with a recruiter is never a bad thing in your space. You know, if you're in tech, find some great tech recruiters and, and, and recruiters at, at organizations that you're targeting and want to work for. And all those things will play in your favor, especially when the unexpected happens and you find yourself in a position where you need to be talking to people. It's like, at that point, you're lagging, you're playing catch up and you know, you're not in a place that you want to be to set yourself up for success. Really good advice. Um, and you might you might not know the answer to this question, but if you were to guess, I mean, there's there's big companies, medium, small companies. Not everyone has the funds for a recruiter. Do, what would be your guess as to what percentage of jobs that are out there get get a recruiter signed to them and get posted? Oh my gosh, that's a great not, question. And I'll I be honest, wondered, yeah, I, right? <laughs> I don't know a percentage, so I'm not going to throw one out there because I'm, and actually now I want to look into this because I'm very curious about the answer to that question, but just now, you know, I, again, it does depend on the size of the organization, sure. but even sometimes you'd be surprised at, you know, an organization and how big, you know, the last talent team I was a part of was over a hundred people. We had like wow. 30 to 40 sourcers, which are the people that help us, you know, in looking for, let's say passive job seekers. Um, right. And you know, now I'm on a, on a, a small, but mighty team, you know, we've got five. So it's like, you just really don't know. Um, you don't, it you depends. don't know. Yeah. Um, but I think yeah. it's important for, com- for job seekers. Like if you, that relationship with a recruiter is so important. If you're targeting a certain size company where they might have funds for a recruiter, but like, I think about my dinky little startup job search journey you know, we, it was just an intern position, but we didn't have a recruiter. Like we didn't have the funds for that. We just posted <laughs> on our socials. Right. Um, right. So if you wanted a super early teeny weeny startup, then it might be different. So. Yeah. And exactly. And I think even, you know, Syndigo has pivoted this last year and, and where we were, you know, before using more external agencies. Um, and then some companies will have their hiring managers really diving in, but your hiring managers, you know, your leaders, they're, while recruitment is a part of their job in terms of interviewing and hiring, you know, bringing new talent onto their team mm-hmm. and grooming um, people to to grow, the recruitment is not their main job. So no, that, no, yeah. in that case, you know, you've got a, a process that might be moving a lot slower, um, you know, not as many resources. Just a lot of things can fall through the cracks that way. Uh, the quality of the hire could go down because maybe the hiring manager just needs somebody there to help them. And so they're wearing rose colored glasses and kind of blinded by certain things. So a recruiter really can help you gain perspective. And a consultative recruiter is someone that's going to be able to come in and just be that partner throughout the journey and be the expert for you. So you don't have to be because that's not your job. Right. And and so when you partner with a hiring manager to write the job posting, do you then need to get it vetted through like legal and HR like and all of that? So again, I think it, it really is just one of those that depends answers again. Sure. But I would say like, yes, I partner with legal. I generally to create, you know, templates and make sure that the wording I'm using is appropriate. But for me, it's all about using using the same tone that the company you know, the feeling that we have here. So we're a very casual company here at Syndigo. So our job descriptions are written a little bit more casually than maybe others that are just very, I don't know, buttoned up. I would say. Uh, Right, right. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I would say, does it match the tone of your company? If you're writing a super buttoned up job description, but you are a really casual company, I mean, what are you attracting? And and job seekers really want to, they, they put a lot of weight on the verbiage that you're using in your job descriptions. And if they read something that is not resonating with them, you know, that's another point is like the whole DEI and, and just making sure that you're being inclusive in the language that you're using. So you're not 
you know, making someone feel like they don't belong. So all of those things really matter. A lot of thought. Yeah, no, and, it, and people um, and or should pay attention. <laughs> no, and people pay attention. Absolutely, they do. And I, the more and more conversations I have with people, the more and more that just is becoming apparent to me that, you know, you can't just slap a job posting up and expect for like hundreds or thousands of candidates to, mm -hmm. to flow in. And that's another piece is that a lot of recruiters are waiting for those applicants um, but you're not necessarily getting the talent that you're looking for. So recruitment is, you know, you're not just sitting on the bench waiting for something to come to you or someone right. in this space right. to come to you. You really have to be out there immersed in the space that you work in, creating those relationships. Well, you're right. It's no longer if they build it, if you build it, they will come environment. Not if you want to get really target, if you want to really get the right people. I agree with that. Right. Um, right. So what are, where, you know, what are your go-to sources for finding candidates? Where do you, where do you look? Oh, well, I guess the obvious probably is LinkedIn. Um, definitely all over LinkedIn, pretty much all day, every day. But outside mm -hmm. of that, I mean, this is a, this is a human sport. I'll, I'll say it, I guess, for the lack of a better term at the moment is I'm looking for referrals. I'm looking to tap into the community, the network that I've built and invested in um, because good people know good people. And so I, I love referrals, employee referrals, or just, you know, I, I talked to actually one of my favorites and, and this is a tip for job seekers is if the job isn't right for you, or for some reason, maybe it was the right fit for you, but you, the timing was off and you ended up needing to accept another offer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, be that person that offers value by saying, Hey, I know that it didn't work out with me, but here's another really great person that I think could be a great fit for your team. And one of my, um, someone just recently did that. And we ended up hiring the person that she referred because she was very thoughtful about it. She said, based on what I know about the team and the company so far, I think that this other candidate would slot in. Like, if you like me, you're going to like this person. And she was right. And so that, you know, just took her to a whole nother level in my book. And oh, something yeah. that I will you're gonna you know, remember never her. forget. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, when it comes to using LinkedIn, do you just use the same version that Joe Jobseeker uses, or do you per do you have you purchased uh, LinkedIn's software or their programs for this? Yeah, so I do use LinkedIn Recruiter. Um, we also are, you know, again blessed to have some tools that maybe not everybody has, um, and so that helps in terms of getting can't contact information. Because sometimes people want to be reached, but I have definitely seen people leave their phone number off their resume. They've left it off of their LinkedIn profile or their contact information. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we're like, in a, we're investigators too, you know, <laughs> we've got to dig deep and we've got to figure out how to kind of hunt people down um, in some cases. So, yeah, I would say that most recruiters out there are using some form of, you know, LinkedIn or maybe Indeed, um, you know, some of the older tools that I don't. I haven't used in a while, but like Career Builder or Monster, right, right. I don't even know if some of those are still around, to be honest. But yeah, those are all good tools, but primarily LinkedIn and and not just LinkedIn as a job board, but LinkedIn as a community. So, you know, being involved in on the platform, but not just when you're looking for a job, when you're just if you're if you really can get in there and figure out how to build relationships and be immersed in the space and in your industry and so on, like become a thought leader by just sharing, you know, if you have information that is, you know, you're one day further along than someone else in your career, you know, you've got something to offer. And so I think that it's a really good place to kind of like a fun sandbox to play in and um, meet a lot of phenomenal people along the way. Oh yeah, no, and that's that's how you and I met. Um, you also yep. gave, <laughs> you also another tip that you just offered is that don't if you are in job search mode, don't make it hard for people to be able to get in touch with you. Um, some people don't realize that their privacy settings are set so that it's hard to reach the person, or um, mm -hmm. they don't have their contact information listed. Um, I you know I know when I write people's resumes even though I put the contact information in the contact section, I also stick it in the about section and try to make it as easy as possible for someone who's visiting my profile to easily be able to connect with me. 
Absolutely. Don't make it a guessing game, right? Because if I really like your profile, I will dig to a certain extent, but especially in today's market, what everybody is calling, you know, this great resignation, the great reawakening, (laughs) whatever you're calling it, um, you know, that's, that's absolutely something to consider because I'm only going to go so far. I'm not going to chase you to the ends of the earth to try to have one conversation when we've never met before. So yeah, absolutely. Make it easy for people to find you. Yep, exactly. Um, Okay, next topic that um, is the fodder for many, many, many blog articles and posts. Um, ATS, which is Apt Tracking Software Systems. Um, Can you explain ATS to us in just basic terms? Um, There are so many misunderstandings. I'd love to hear how that, how ATS serves people in recruiting, people in HR, all of that. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a great question. And one that I, before I really started working in them, found confusing as well. I always thought for a long time that, you know, these, there were these ATSs out there that were just like picking through keywords. And if your resume didn't have enough keywords, then it was like spitting you out on the other side and not moving you forward. And, and while yes, that can be true, what I have found is that most of them are not operating that way. Honestly, my ATS is a great place for me to stay organized. And that's kind of the end of the day. It's where I could keep track of all of my candidates moving through any given process, make sure I understand like what process or what part of the stage, you know, what stage they're in, um, in the journey. I mean, it really is just an organizational tool to keep me on the same page with my hiring managers, with my candidates. Um, so again, there's a lot of different kinds, a lot of different complexities. Some are very simple to some that include the candidate a lot more where you can actually have a build out a profile and, and be alerted when things match certain tags and skills and keywords. So it really can get quite crazy. But I, I think for today, just to keep it simple, just understand that an ATS is a way that recruiters keep themselves organized and, uh, you know, trying to jump through hoops to almost like beat the algorithm or whatever <laughs> is not really um, the best way to approach your job search. It's a distraction, in my opinion. I think really where people need to focus is on the skills that they have, tailoring those to the skills that the job is asking for. And if you're doing that and you're tailor- tailoring, you're personalizing, then, you know, and building relationships, then whatever people choose to do with their ATS really doesn't matter because you're giving yourself multiple avenues. I love that. And um, and I hear what you're saying. LinkedIn, for you, ATS is a, is a really great filing cabinet. Um, and it sounds like you, like many other recruiters, really go through and you read resumes. I think there's a big misnomer that um, ATS screens your resume out to the a recruiter won't see it unless, you know, the person with the most keywords wins. And it sounds like that is not the case in your book. Yeah, it's not. And, you know, even some of the questions that we have asked for certain, you know, certain times we might ask somebody what their salary requirement is. If our, if we're going to pay, I'm just throwing out some numbers. If we're going to pay mm-hmm. 60000 let's say for this one entry level position, um, but somebody's looking for 80000 I'm still going to see their resume and their profile. You know, I'm going to see that they're looking for 80000 but as a recruiter, you know, we're going through and I'm looking at your resume, I'm looking at your credentials, the things that make you, you, your LinkedIn profile, kind of trying to put together all these pieces. And, you know, that's just one of them. It's just, it's just a piece, piece of the puzzle. Thank you. That helps quite a bit. Um, Cause I know so many people are just afraid of it and they, they, you could turn yourself into a pretzel trying to write for machines versus people. Well, and then you're talking yourself, you're making excuses, right? Because you're like, oh, well, I just can't beat the ATS. And so you give yourself reasons and excuses to maybe not do the thing because you're thinking that you're just going to be blocked anyway. And so that, I think part of it also comes down to mindset, which is a whole nother topic. But I would just encourage people to not let the ATS get you all in a bunch, you know, like you said, all kind of like twirled up like a pretzel, just Just do the things that you need to do. Put one foot in front of the other. Take the steps you need to take. And the ATS is just part of the process to help everybody stay organized. I love that. And that's what you were saying about building the relationships, tailoring the resume, giving yourself multiple avenues. You're effectively, effectively, it sounds like you're 
ATS is not always the first point of entry. It's a point of entry, but there's others as well. Absolutely. I, as you alluded to in the very beginning of, of this podcast episode is that, you know, I have landed my last couple of roles without applying. And, and so you can skip the ATS almost essentially altogether in certain cases when you're building the right kinds of relationships and when you are aligned with what you're doing and you understand what you're motivated by. Um, and then you're able to tailor all of that and tell the story. And that's also what it comes down to is just how well can you articulate your story, your talents, the things that you want, and how well can you align them and connect those dots to what the organization is looking for, their pain points and challenges, um, the things that also excite them, you know, um, how right. well do all those things align? Okay. No, that was a really great explanation. Thank you. Um, all right. So next question, I'm just reading through my notes. How do you <laughs> vet someone? So what what are you looking for what, when you're looking at a resume, at a LinkedIn profile? You know, I don't know if you read cover letters or not um, to decide, you know what, this person is worth calling. I guess if you don't have a relationship with them already. Right. Yeah. If I don't have a relationship, you know, then I really am just looking, okay, what did the hiring manager tell me they were looking for? Like, what were their must-haves? which I articulate in the job description, what were their deal breakers again, which is as often as I can articulate kind of what that looks like through really the must haves. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately I'm, I'm looking for that alignment. I'm looking for the person to tell me their story and why they think not why, like, it's not like, Oh, why am I there? Or why are they going to fit for us? But it's, 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 it's all around. It's vice versa. It's mutual alignment. Yeah. So mutual I'm fit, looking yeah. for, Right. So like, if you can't tell your full story through your resume, that's when I'm maybe looking for a cover letter and your cover letter should articulate things that are not on your resume. So I'm not looking for you to just regurgitate, you know, some of the stats that you put in your resume on your cover letter. No, I'm, that's the, that's the supporting document. You know, that's, that's the piece that I am trying to see. Who are you? What makes you, you, why do you care about, you know, this space or this position or, you know, why do you think that this could be a good fit for you and kind of articulate that story? Um, but I'll, with that said, I don't require cover letters ever. And I, I don't care if, if someone does or doesn't submit one. Again, it's just a supporting document to help me make a more informed decision. So at the end of the day, that's what your resume is. It, it's a, a document that the hiring manager or recruiter can use to make an informed decision of whether or not to move forward. The best way to do that is to create alignment, connect the dots eliminate confusion. And so when I just, when I see somebody that aligns, maybe it's through keywords or just like the bullets that they choose to share on their resume, maybe it's the companies they've worked at. So understanding that Syndigo right now is about a thousand person global company. We're in over 14 countries. You know, if I see somebody that has similar software as a service experience. Um, they've also worked for other global companies. You know, that type of a person is going to seem interesting to me. But with that said, I'm also not, you know, leaving out the people that maybe didn't come from that background. So it, it is kind of a weird question in terms of like, I will just look at someone's resume and then sometimes it's a feeling I get too. It's like an energy and, and, but it's not only one thing. I have to take all of these pieces together so your LinkedIn profile, your resume, the energy I feel, the way you choose to articulate your story, you know, are there a bunch of grammar mistakes on your resume for a position that requires high attention to detail? You know what I mean? It's like those things. Well, how can you have high attention to detail if there are a ton of mistakes on your resume? Right. It means a few that's things. an example of misalignment, right? Exactly. Like, how can I be looking for that person and then be able to say that you're bringing that to the table when my first impression of you is a resume that does not show me that you have attention to detail. So it's just certain things like that. It's really awareness and paying attention, you know, to, to your surroundings and to the, the organizations that you're applying for. I mean, does it make sense? And if you can't articulate it to the company, then how am I supposed to connect the dots and, you know, all the way if, if you're not even aligned on what it is that, that you want to do? It feels like a mix of art and science, right? With the art being like the gut feel <laughs> and things like that, right? And then the science yeah. is the, the companies who work for all that. Um, okay, the next thing I wanted to ask you about, um, because you hear a lot about it, we alluded to it earlier, is the whole notion of being ghosted by people. And I know ghosting is mm -hmm. a two-way street. Um, what advice can you share um, or can you share some insight on 
what might be going on behind the scenes um, in cases where people feel like they're ghosted, ghosted and an approach that you might recommend to balance, you know, showing interest without feeling like a stalker. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, there's, and that goes on my side too. You know, sometimes I've got to, if I'm excited about a candidate, I've got to remind myself to like chill on the emotional part of it. And, and um, so, and that's what I would remind people to do is you could be really excited about a position. So let us know that. I want to know when, when someone is excited. Um, but to answer your question around ghosting. So there's a lot of different reasons this happens in my world. You know, I'm certainly not going to sit here and say, I've never, you know, things haven't fallen through the cracks. With that said, sure. ghosting to me implies almost like an intentionality yeah, and, and a lack of organization on, in some cases, because if a recruiter is really overwhelmed and you're a candidate and let's say you're like middle of the pack, so you're not the, the top candidate, but maybe you're not the, 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 you know, low man on the totem pole, low person on the totem pole. Um, you know, you could fall in this weird middle category. I don't know. Let's call it the, the friend zone or something like where the place that people don't really want to get stuck sometimes. Um, you know, you, you fall into this area and, and you can, again, just kind of fall through the cracks. So I would say on a recruiter's part, it's not always intentional. Like they're not like, oh, I'm just not going to reach back out to Virginia ever again. You know, um, I think it's a mix of things. You know, sometimes a candidate doesn't show as much interest and then they're, e they're easier to forget, to be completely honest, because, right. you know, we have life-changing conversations on a daily basis on both sides. And so if you're one of those candidates that's just kind of, um, you know, you're not showing emotion, enthusiasm, you're not able to come up with strong examples to support your skills and your work. I mean, there's a million different reasons why right. you could just kind of fall off of somebody's radar. And then it happens the other way around too. A candidate will decide, you know what, I, on the call, I said I was interested, but then I got off and realized, you know, this really just wasn't for me. I felt uncomfortable telling the recruiter that it wasn't for me. So now I'm just never going to talk to them again. I mean, I've definitely had candidates drop oh, yeah. off in interview processes at offer stages. Um, but typically the way I'm able to get around this is by setting expectations early and often. So at the, at the first phone conversation I have with anyone that I'm moving forward with, I'm letting them know, Hey, listen, the, here's what to expect from me, a very transparent, authentic conversation. That's going to help you assess the alignment that you're looking for and make sure that we have that on both sides in order to move forward. Um, and I ask from them to please keep me posted with what's going on in their world. If you have an offer that surfaces, let me know, not after you've accepted the offer, but before, right. you know, it's like, it's just the communication at the end of the day that I think really removes the barriers of ghosting because you just, you make people feel comfortable. You let them know that if this job isn't for you, you're not hurting my feelings. But what I do expect from you is right. to be honest about it. So we cannot waste each other's time. And so if you have a job seeker who, and I'm sure this happens where a, a recruiter might say, okay, we should be able to, you should be hearing from us one way or the other in a week and stuff happens behind the scenes and a week goes by. Like what, is there a sort of a time frame that you recommend? You know, this is, this is the, this is the perfect amount of time to wait that you know, shorter than this, it's too much longer than this. And you don't show interest. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know there's no you know, one size fits all answer to this, but. No, there's not. But I think that there are some good best practices. And for me, that starts with, you know, listen, I'm not looking for someone to just fawn all over me or tell me how wonderful I am. But a, a thank you note goes a long way. So whether it's with a hiring manager or a recruiter, I always recommend follow up your conversation with a, hey, thanks for taking time for me today. Thanks for learning about my background. Here's what I found exciting about what we talked about. And I'm looking forward to next steps. Simple email tying it back to something you spoke about in your conversation, leave it at that. Now, from there, I would say, depending on the timeline they've set for you, I typically let people know, hey, I'll be back within 24 to 48 hours. If you, if it's been 48 hours and you have not heard from me, reach out. You know what I mean? And okay. if somebody gives you a week timeline, don't reach out before the week because they're telling you that they need a week. Um, with that said, I would say to reach out if you had something change. So if you thought about it more and you felt like you need to change your compensation requirement or an offer popped up from another company or you decide to remove yourself from the process, I mean, the list goes on and on. If there's an update for your recruiter, let them know. That's another great way to touch, um, have a touch point. 
the final one of the final ways I'll recommend is if you see something of value that let's say in the conversation, I told you how much I love sushi um, and you love sushi, too. So, you know, we started talking about sushi and we got off the call and you saw something sushi related that you were just like really felt like, you know, you have to really feel like it's going to matter to that person. Right. Or it can come off as disingenuous. But right. Right. I love when people reach out and just say, oh, hey, I was thinking of you because you said this thing. And so that's another way you can be on their radar. It's just like, always think about how you can leave every interaction better than you found it. And I think when you have that approach, then it doesn't come across like you're being a stalker. Even if you reach out two days after and then five days after, I would just say, keep kind of a regular cadence. Um, But then also be weary of of journeys that are maybe taking a little bit longer Um, and and maybe recruiters or hiring managers that just aren't ever doing what they say they're going to do like that on your side should also be a red flag. So as a recruiter, I'm always looking to communicate always, always, always over communicate. I find that then people feel like they're in the know and they're willing to be more patient when you do need to maybe have a week in between when you don't have answers yet. I agree with that. Um, So those are, you gave three really, I'm just going to recap what you said in terms of when it makes sense to reach out first is when there's a change or an update on your end that you know pertains to your job, your job situation or your, um, you know, the information that you gave to the recruiter. Two is after if the deadline or the time frame has passed um, that you were given, uh, you know, at the onset. And then third is if you see something of, of if there's something you want to share of value related to the discussion. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. So second and last question, do you have a job search or a recruiting faux pas? Just something that drives you crazy that you see people do. This is where you get to be snarky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of recruiting faux pas. There's a lot of job seeker faux pas. So what I'll say go with is job, ser- biggest... job seeker. Yeah. Go with job seeker faux pas. It's just, I think is, not building relationships is just applying and applying and applying blindly without tailoring your resume. And and I can tell when someone's tailored for the most part versus when they're not. And it's it's okay if they don't have, haven't completely tailored their resume, done some huge revamp. It doesn't need to be that. So I think that's definitely one of my biggest kind of pet peeves is when you have the skills, you have the potential, but you haven't invested in yourself enough to be able to articulate your story in a way that makes sense for the person reading your audience on the other end, whether that's your resume, your LinkedIn profile. So I just, I I wish people would just invest in themselves a little bit more in that way. Understanding that, that extra 10 minutes you spent on your resume to tweak it for a specific job. I mean, that could make all the difference. And if you don't, if you're not good at that, you know, some people are just not great at writing or they're not great at putting their skills down on paper. And I think that's when you have to be not afraid to call in call in, you know, the backup. All in some we don't, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't go fix my own car. I mean, I'm not a, a mechanic. I'm not a doctor. Like I call in the experts, right? I mean, there's all these analogies. You call in the people when you need support mm-hmm. and this is no different. People like you and, you know, career coaches, resume writers, other recruiters that are just willing to give you, you know, feedback, other hiring managers that you are close with that know you inside and out. I mean, ask for help, put yourself out there because when you do that, then someone else is out there with ears listening for you. Um, and I could give a million examples of when that works. So uh, <laughs> that's and, only, and I think what, a faux pas. And what you were saying about how, you know, you, you're it, part of the alignment is that you're, you're showing interest. Um, yes. and you, you guys can tell when a, when a resume has been has been tailored. And so that extra effort of tailoring is another way of showing interest, right? Absolutely. You sh- yeah. yeah, it shows that you do care, that you've put some level of effort in because you feel like there's alignment and you want to make sure that I know about that alignment too. Right. So don't right. wait exactly. for, yeah, don't wait for the recruiter or the hiring manager, or whoever, you know, put insert someone there. Don't wait for them to ask you the questions that you want to answer. Make sure that you are answering those questions proactively, connecting those dots. Because that's what you, we don't want to have to pull things out of you. It's exhausting. It's draining when we're just having to like, you, we ask you a question, you give us a one word answer. I mean, that's not working. You know what I mean? You want to show the skills that you're going to use in the job, show the skills in the interview process. 
No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, Tabitha, last question, and then I'm going to let you go because you've, uh, you've been so generous with your time. Um, you have lots of hats, as I indicated at the beginning with the bio. What is next for you? What are your plans for 2022? Yeah, this year I'm super excited because in addition to recruitment, I actually am working on our employer branding and recruitment marketing with our awesome marketing team. And um, and an example of, I actually got to hire uh, someone, one of our new digital marketing specialists, Abby. Abby and I now get to collaborate on a project together for recruitment marketing. And this is what I mean by... Yes, this is why I love my job because like I said, I'm hiring my colleagues and now I get to actually work with her, which is kind of a unique scenario. It doesn't always happen in my world, but it's just a, a cool thing. So that's what's next for me is really continuing to just grow as a recruiter and become better at what I do and hone in on my craft, but also to expand into the world of more so things I do kind of on a day-to-day basis, but now really focused on recruitment marketing for Syndigo as a, as a company and, and just help continue to attract the best people um, to what we're building here. So I'm, I'm really pumped about that. Thanks for asking. That's exciting. So if people want to follow you because you share lots of great insights and advice, um, I've listed on the bio, your LinkedIn um, tab of the recruiter and your Twitter handle, which is also tap the recruiter. Are those the two best places to keep tabs on you, no pun intended, or other <laughs> site. I just realized that. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Hey, I'm always good for, I'm good for a cheesy pun or whatever. There you go. <laughs> I take them. I make them often on purpose. Okay. So, no, I love it. Um, I would say, to be honest, LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach me right now. Okay. So I have some other social media, but LinkedIn is really where you're going to find me active and able to engage and, and those types of things. So um, Yeah best way to find me in the comments or posting or, you know, I'm around. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so, so much. You, I, I feel like you, you've just done such a great job of clearing up a lot of misconceptions and giving really actionable tips so that job seekers have, have a way to approach recruiters and build that relationship. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you giving me the platform to do this. I just, I really want to help job seekers land the job of their dreams. And it might sound cliche or what have you, but I really believe that there's alignment out there for everyone. It just is dependent on your mindset, your level of awareness, and really the effort you're willing to put in, which doesn't always mean you need to be jumping over the moon, but just, you know, putting yourself out there and trying new things. Um, I'm excited. And I hope that these tips will help somebody land somewhere that they really, really want to be. I'm sure they will. Thank you again. Absolutely. Thanks, Virginia. You've been listening to The Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco. To learn more about storytelling strategies to catch the eye of today's online skim hiring and decision makers, please visit www.virginiafrancoresumes.com.